This Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS. For a limited time, enjoy two great PCGS services for one unbelievable price, free. As part of the latest PCGS quarterly grading special, collectors can take advantage of free PCGS secure service and TrueView photos. Visit pcgs.com slash cc special to find out more. In this episode of the Coin Week podcast, I sit down with Champion Auctions President Michael Chu for a rapid-fire, no-holds-barred discussion on Asian coins and the Asian coin market. Michael is one of the foremost experts in the industry on the subject of the growing Asian coin market, and I wanted a crash course from him on how that market operates as compared to the coin market here in the United States. Uh, so, Michael, thanks for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Thank you, thank you, Charles, and I'm very happy to join this for the first time, and uh, hopefully, we have a very good experience. So, uh, obviously, it's, you, you don't have to really be an expert in Asian numismatics to realize that, uh, as an as an American collector, that the Asian numismatic scene has become really big in recent years. So, what what give me like sort of the uh, psychological profile of the Typical uh, collector in China. Oh, a typical collector is someone you know new, and you know lots, a lot of them are exposed to the coin market through the banking system. Like there's there's new banking kind of a, you know a high value customers. They'll send them specialty flyers, information, you know mo- mobile devices, and they, they have selective you know kind of subscription. Like for example, a very successful program recently is the Twitter and Pandas from the Twitter and Mints. You know the Shenyang, Shanghai, and the Global Mints. And certify, you know, set of three, and that's sold out, you know, very quickly. So you said that the uh, coins are distributed through the banks. That seems like a major difference in the way collectors get coins in uh, in, in China than maybe they would get in the United States. But that's right. You know, it's a, it's a new kind of phenomenon that has been prevalent in Asia, like in Japan, Korea. You know, they're, they're selling through the banks. That's been happening for 20, 30 years there. But for China, it's a recent phenomenon in the last five years, and it's been very successful. So the uh, banks are they are they they're, they're not selling vintage material are they? Uh, no, there's mostly modern coins. And the banks, uh, the one pilgrim they had recently was uh, last year Senya Sen, you know, anniversary. They had a you know a junk dollar and a Senya Sen memento dollar that was uh, certified by the China Numismatic Association. You know, that's uh, a, a, a kind of a Chinese you know version of grading service kind of. So. Uh, I mean, are are collectors in this uh, in this market? Are they mostly interested in like uh, local or national issues? Are they buying, uh, you know, what they would consider world coins, which would include coins from like you know North America and Europe? Well, one one other thing that's very popular here in China is the is the, is the you know the investment coins, silver coins they call them, you know, the silver eagle, the maple leaf, you know, the Britannia, you know, they they put them in, in sets. You know, including the Chinese panda, and sell them as you know world's uh, investment silver coins, and that has been very, very popular in China in the last four or five years. So, uh, and hundreds of thousands of sets have been sold this way. So, and so then people, if they like collecting that area, they, they're going to buy the, a set each year. Uh, well, you know, only only the Chinese panda actually has a different design every year. But for the Chinese investors, you know, what happens? They start buying them in quality, quantity actually. Excuse me, you know, like for example, they will buy you know silver eagles, you know, in larger quantities. But they start with the sets, right? You know, you know, one individual set. Some people do collect by year, and some people you know become a, a larger participant. Like for example, people buying the entire boxes of pandas, it's like five hundred forty pieces, you know, kind of like monster boxes in the U.S. for silver eagles. You know, a larger commitment and to invest in the silver coinage. So, so the Chinese Panda Bullion Coin Program has been a huge success. I mean, uh, it's uh, an iconic animal for China. So, it's 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 grown out of its uh, domestic, you know, market well into like America and Europe. Right. Do, do do Chinese collectors? I mean, it's a very complex series. I mean, there's a lot of very difficult coins. There's a lot of variety. I mean, Chinese collectors. Uh, like for example, I mean, the Ch- some of the Chinese uh, model are into this high net net worth, uh, you know, kind of a banking customer. Like for example, one company in China has also over 200 complete sets of the gold pandas. When they started, the sets would be trading between 100, 120 thousand U.S. and then at the peak was 300 thousand. So you would be very, very 
hard to find equivalent in the U.S. market that some U.S. you know new collector would spend three hundred thousand dollars on a set of coins. But in China, that that has obviously has happened because the they focus catered around you know high value customers with deposit of a million dollars or more sitting in their savings accounts, and then there some of those customers have moved maybe twenty thirty percent of their savings into investment coins. You know, and basically start buying, you know, higher value coins like these sets, like the, you know, larger size gold coins. You know, it's been very successful because the bank, the banking system, you know, who has funds to pay, be able to purchase these these items, you know, which is a little bit different from the U.S., I think. I think it's very, very unusual you have someone in the U.S. buying, you know, U.S., uh, one U.S. ego set or, or a complete set of egos for $150,000. Right. And that's the really difference I see in the last couple of years. And, and uh, as far as um, one of the things that I think about when I look at investment coins in the United States, it seems like in the American marketplace, there's sort of a, a divide between uh, uh, the classic material and modern material. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, dealers who specialize in classic material look at modern coins uh, like the Silver Eagle program, things like that, simply as bullion. Is that sort of prejudice carried over in China? I mean, do dealers who specialize in classic material kind of look down on like modern investing in coins? Uh, that, that's all, that's typically true in China also because uh, you know they require a, a different kind of uh, expertise. And also with the recent uh, phenomenon of the grading, it takes a lot of need for expertise out of the formula. But a lot of the coins that come directly from the mint now, you have early strikes, first day of issue. So a lot of these participants in the modern coin market are more marketers. Than the numismatic experts, you know, so that's uh, maybe very similar to to the U.S. market. And most of the vintage, you know, dealers and you know auction houses are focused on vintage coins. And then there, there are all the online auction houses in China focused entirely on modern coins. And with modern coins, there's more supply. You know, there's more is new issues and also larger issues. So, so you know, from a business fundamental, you know, there's much big, bigger business. Is is to be involved in modern coin. It's it's more turnkey. Uh, right, exactly. It, it, they they have become more a marketing company rather than new mystitists, you know, in handling the modern coins. So what's the cutoff date for where you say like Chinese modern coins began and, and classic coins? Well, Chinese coins modern are... coins usually they say began in 1979. And that's where the first P, you know, PRC coins started. And then, you know, in Chinese modern coins, there's two periods. Like from 1979 to 1999, these considered classical modern Chinese coins. And after, you know, 1999 is the more modern modern Chinese coins. You know, the stuff that were higher minage and also more... Uh, Kind of a diverse <clears throat> design and larger mintage <clears throat> and different coinage. So uh, obviously, I, I think uh, if you want to look at Chinese uh, coins, uh, uh, one of the factors that is different than in the United States is that you know the United States uh, has not demonetized any of its coins, but you know, uh, in China, you know, you had periods of time where it was very culturally sensitive where you know maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to have imperial coins or things like this it seems like a lot of classic numismatic material is probably destroyed uh, due to political reasons over the years do you see that it has attitudes towards like Chinese past by you know China changed to the fact that they can that they are more comfortable uh, honoring and respecting and studying like, it. For like, like for example you know back in the 1920s and 30s it was very very common for people, you know, to receive at weddings, you know, these Chinese silver dollars, you know, with a Chinese uh, red, you know, lucky double happiness character on them. And it seems like in the last 10, 15 years, that's become popular again in China. You know, it's gifts so the old classical silver coins for luck. Right. So, so now there's, I think, a much bigger acceptance of the past history of these coins. And now, you know, more general public has been exposed to these coins, you know. Which was like kind of in the 50s and 60s, and people just didn't touch because you're not supposed to collect in those days. And also, the People's Bank was the only agency that could handle bullion, silver, and gold. So a lot of rare coins actually got melted. Right. You know, when they started the new, you know, you know, the coin pilgrim in 1979, when you talk to the men employees, they were like very, very horrified that these classical gold coins from the 1920s and 30s was turning into raw material. Right. So I guess I, I guess you know that that does help value because attrition is like one of the main drivers for value down the road. That's true, and also you know in, in the last ten years, the people think has time to centralize the holding of all these silver coins. So a lot of silver coins actually are held in this uh, one, this northern city in Sijiazhuang. It's actually a very big quantity of these coins, and you know, and there's been various discussions that they might do something similar to the U.S. 
you know, sixty dollars, maybe they put them all in the special holders, have a lottery, and distribute them because they've been holding out and taking up a lot of space in uh, in China. And there was history <coughs> of distribution of these coins first in the U.S. and then the Japanese uh, finance ministry distributed the coins, and the Taiwan ministry also distributed all these junk dollars that was made in the U.S. and sent to Taiwan, right. you know, and that way do lottery. You know, so we see maybe in the future that China might do the same thing to distribute these coins, which is actually going to be very good for the coin market. Yeah, I mean, uh, when the uh, GSA Morgans uh, were getting ready to be released, I mean, coin dealers in this country were terrified. They right, thought that it was right. going to crash the market because that's right. it needs to be a overabundance. But in right. reality, what it did is it brought millions of new collectors right. in the market that never even thought about coins. Yeah, and then you know, from, from you know, previous, you know, previous buyers of the GSAs, a lot of them never collected coins. And then they put this in the lottery because they felt that this was very interesting to get a piece of all the old classic Wild West. You know, you know history, and you know it's part of luck what you get. You know when you when you order these coins, and some very rare coins went into these distribution channels. You know, one of the things you know when you when I read uh, auction catalogs uh, that are produced here in the United States, even from some of the major firms, it, it seems to me that like highly specialized knowledge towards Chinese numismatics is often lacking in descriptions. Um, there seems to be. More concern about you know grade and 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 rarity or supposed rarity of a piece, but not so much really like a, a attachment or knowledge about the history behind the coin. Now you, you run you run an auction house and and you, you you are tasked with marketing coins to an audience that's probably more familiar with Chinese history than Americans would be. How, how difficult is it to... Well, to I, I think, you know, there has been a serious drop-off in talent and experience. Like, for example, in the last year I have interviewed, you know, you know, various, you know, people that were involved in trading of these coinage. Like, for example, Andre de Clamont from Spink. He handled most of the most uh, rarest coins from the Heaton Archive. Also, the big, you know, Eli Wallet, you know, transaction to the guy in Taiwan, you know, you know, H. Chang, and then also Don Camperro, who who sold a lot of these, supplied a lot of these coins since the 60s and 70s. And in reality, the true expertise are now hidden behind these uh, kind of, uh, you know, behind the scenes. Transaction. They have a lot of new companies are involved in these in these business, and they have very little history with trading these coins. And you know, it's very hard to for them to add anything to the description when they never handled it. They're, they don't understand the history. Like for example, a coin that came from Wayne Raymond in 1948 went to a UBS auction in 1979 to money company, and then to a client, and they have no way of knowing these things because they were never involved. You know, and reality is a lot of time the expertise is just not there. It's much rarer to see these coins these days versus 20, 30 years ago. And, you know, if you have to not handle it in the past, it's very hard to learn. You know, a lot of coins now are certified and then the holder, so you have much less, you know, ex you know exposure to these coins. But even then, I mean, that, that, that does require, like, a level of familiarity with the coin to make sure that the coin's actually what it purports to be. Well, I mean, you know, to be honest with you, you know, you know, you know like any other service in the world, nobody's 100% correct. So <clears throat> it's very, very uh, prudent for collectors to study and learn and also work with people who have, who have you know, experience in this area and then have something that has a third-party confirmation of what this was to be. You know, it, it's very, very risky <clears throat> to completely trust one party to be, to be the kind of a situation to make judgment for you, you know, unless that they have seen everything. Almost everything, like a 1881 S. Morgan, I'm sure all the grading servers in the U.S. seen almost every one or every variety they should have seen. And there's very, very detailed books out there with dive variety, you know, you know, the David Bowers, you know, study of these coins. But when they on the Asian coin, these things don't exist. And reality with the you know recent technology of making counterfeit has made them much harder to track. And also, you know, the handling previous Pedigree coin would be a lot less risky because all the rare rarity, there's only a few. And then certainly the, when the population multiplies by a, a number that is they're serving, then you have to be more careful. So how big a problem is deceptive counterfeits of Chinese coins in the market? I mean, it's this huge, hugely you know, problem because uh, some, some of the collectors have, you know, become 
very cautious because uh, they, they feel uncertain about some of these coins. And also, so some of these coins are so good, they're actually better than the originals. Right. You know, so, so, and then one thing we have to always say about Chinese coin, not every Chinese coin is the same. Unlike Japanese and German coin, Chinese coin has different weights, they have different, you know, diameters, and, you know, it's very common to have a Chinese coin sitting next to each other, they have different weights. And if you have five coins that weigh the same and look the same, you have a problem. Right. You know, another problem that we, we see that is, is, is the silver fineness of, of, of the coins. You know, in China, no coins 900 silver because talking to the men, people, that they don't put silver into the coin. They take the silver out of the coins. It's always 899 or below, you know, because they want to make money from the transaction. So some silver coins are down to 800 or 600. But if you have a coin that's all 900 fine, you have a problem. Those are modern blanks. Right. The Chinese blanks are not that precise. So some of the new technology could help you to kind of uh, toss stuff out fairly quickly, actually. So do you still encounter uh, coins that you haven't seen before or you're surprised by? Uh, or... Yes, you know, but, but I'm also more suspicious because if the coin doesn't exist for all these times, like, for example, certain rare patterns suddenly start coming out. These silver patterns start showing up in gold and copper and brass. You know, we've never seen them before. And, and then turn out, you know, the coins have some question marks because they were, they're too well made. You know, we have uh, one of the grading servers, people tell me those blanks were made in the last 10 years. You know, the, those quality of blanks did not exist until 10 years ago. So that basically tells you there's a problem here. Right. So, so how, are they, how are they making these copies? Are they taking original pieces? And, uh, I and... think the most, uh, you know, the best fakes are made with original pieces using the laser technique. Some of these really expensive you know, they're almost exact duplications. And then, you know, they have, you know, used sometimes, you know, older machineries. And also, they even have some retired men people helping them to make these old rims. Right. So they look more legit. Because a lot of the coins came out with rims too modern. And they give it away. And then they have hand in tooling to make the rim look older. So it's very sophisticated now because of the value of the coins now. Right. And reality is, it's become much more challenging for the, for the different players in the marketplace, the auction company, grading service, dealers, collectors. So I guess pedigree really starts playing a role. Absolutely. And also, you know, back in the 80s, you know, there were coins that, you know, were well made, but you know, questionable. But now, you know, it's much harder to tell. You know, they're fixed in every generation, you know, but reality is, you know, coins that have been around longer are, are less risky. So uh, what would the uh, Chinese equivalent of the 1804 dollar be? Oh, I, I would think that one of the most popular coins, you know, that people would like to have is the auto dollar. But, but maybe not as rare, but, but it's the first coin with, with a car on it. But in the term of rarity, I would think, you know, that the Hunan coins are probably like the equivalent of 1804 dollars. They were discovered at the Hitman in 1975. You know, people didn't know they exist. There's only six sets. You know, six pairs of the dollar and half dollar. And that was the first coin that sold for over $10,000, purchased by one of my clients. And we later, you know, purchased that coin from him and do a private transaction. We sold that coin and the first Chinese coin that ever sold for over a million dollars, the Yunnan Spring, you know, Autumn coin to one collector in one transaction. That's probably the, the, the most, uh, <clears throat> he's the first collector in Chinese coin to own those two coins simultaneously. So, what would a handful of uh, quality uh, characteristic of the time Chinese coins be for an American collector that wants to get started and maybe start a lifelong journey of learning about and collecting nice uh, Chinese coins? I, I think one, one, one that you know, started will be collecting the Yuan Shikai dollars from the 1914 to 1920. Now, there are now specialized books out there. There's, there's hundreds of varieties now, kind of like the Morgan Dollar series. Even though they only issue a few years, that they'll issue in different areas in China. They were, some of them have actually issued in the 1950s in the Tibet by the Chinese PRC Army because people there used the, you know, the Yuan Shikai dollars as a trade. So you know, they actually had to make you know, examples that was in the 50s. You know. So I think that's a good series for people to start. You, know, some, you could buy a common one for less than $100 and some really nice ones for up to several thousand. And then some of the rare varieties, you got you know, a couple hundred dollars and up. And that's a very great series you know, with all these new books for someone to get involved. You could collect actually Yuan Shikai coins for all different areas in China, right. which is very, you know, different mints too, very interesting. Phenomenon. The, you know, the, the, all the catalogs in the West does not cover it well. So I think you know, eventually you have to help translate some of these Chinese books that specialize in the, in the series into English. 
Uh, also popular, Chuck Dollar is also popular because of it. Uh, Chuck Dollars are popular, but it's only a few years that they were made, and also a lot of them were made in San Francisco. So, you know, a lot of the high quality ones that came out in the 1990s were basically the horror from the Chinese, you know, finance department, you know, that, that you know, came on the market, and a lot of those were sold to marketing companies. And we participated in that market, we sold thousands and thousands of them to marketing companies, you know, at a very reasonable price, and then most of them were repatriated and graded and sold on the market today. You know, but it's only you know two years serious, basically. Other than the birds of the junk, which was actually a, a limited distribution coin. Uh, another popular one, just because of the motif, would be the quite Chao Outer Dollar. Yes, that, that's one of the most famous Chinese coins because it's, that's the first coin with, with the Alto on there. And I think, I believe, it was at Buick. You know, and uh, that that coin's been covered since the you know 1928 since it came out. So that's one of, one of the most most popular Chinese coins. And that also has varieties. Oh yes, it has uh, several varieties. There's a three leaf variety, a two leaf variety. There's a, there's one with the, the dot on the door, and there's this like missing, you know, you know, and, you know dots on this. It's, it's quite a few varieties with those coins. It's it's pretty it's it's pretty interesting. There's some major rarities out of the, that that province too. Oh yes, I mean. yeah. You got you got the fifty cent, you know, twenty cent series that which we graded. It came out of Goodman, so it sold for a couple hundred thousand dollars. This was small size coins, it's quite scarce. And also, you know, you have the bamboo dollars, those are quite rare in high grade, and also there's two variety, you know, there's a square round window, the square window is quite scarce. You know, we have one collector in the West Coast that has over 20 examples, and he, he's a collector that's been collecting Chinese coins for quite a long time. And one time he had over 16 you know, mausoleum dollars, and there's only 480 of those struck. So this guy collecting, you know, if something you like, he collects them in quantity, you know. So there are, all, you know, collectors out there that will surprise you with, the ability to accumulate coins, but they were really more available in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So are, are these three types of coins, I mean, are they, uh, are they available uh, to uh, collectors in uh, gem condition, or they usually come like choice or below? Uh, they usually come in like, you know, BF, you know, but in really, you know, genuine, you know, certified hunk, they're quite expensive, you know. We sold the highest grade NCC one last August in Hong Kong in the MS 63 for, about, I think, 135, 140,000. And then we, we sold, uh, a uh, scarcer variety, uh, a three-leaf variety, which is a scarcer than a two-leaf that was sold in August in MS61 PCGS for 115. So when you talk about truly on coins, you, you're basically talking about 100 to 150 thousand. So that's for the out of dollar. What about the other two uh, coins we were talking about? Uh, you know, the bamboo dollars. None has ever been auctioned in Ankh. You know, I would say a, a genuine Ankh today would bring probably 100, 150 thousand. You know, for 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 a round window variety, which is common. A, a square window variety, only two has been certified, I think, so far. And I think the highest grade is except that coin come to the market, I would say it would be $100,000. And the junk dollar? Uh, junk dollars, um, it's, uh, you mean the pattern or the regular junk dollars? The regular, regular issue. Uh, regular yeah. junk dollars, I mean, they come nice, you know, like, for example, a 65, you know, with the birds over junk, 1932, I would say five to 8,000. And then the year 22, 1933, about two to 3,000. And you know, 65, year 23, which are, with a lot of restrike in San Francisco, that coin's probably $1,000 now. So that's obtainable. Yes. I mean, those are the coins that we sold 20 years ago, you know, to the U.S. marketers for $15. In the same quality, the original bags that came back from San Francisco. So uh, an, another popular type, which has many, 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 many varieties, is a dragon dollar. Yes. Can you tell me, like, what, what was the, what's the motif represent, and, and why, is, why, why was this... Coin struck in so many different types. Well, the dragon represents the emperor. You know, the emperor did not want his portrait to be on the coin so people could touch it. So the imperial dragon, you know, the dragon on the dragon coin, it represents the emperor. So, you know, every province usually have different dragons. You know, they will express their own design. A lot of these dragons were actually designed by Westerners. Like, for example, you know, the, the Wayne family, you know, in England, there were, there were some Germans, you know, the Otto Bin, you know, German dragon, and this uh, French. And then, you know, the U.S. actually, Charles Barber designed the set. The Sichuan, you know, and back in the late 1890s, you know, the the Sichuan dragon was designed by the chief designer of the U.S. Mint, Charles Bobber. Right, and, and actually, if you notice, the dragon has like five fingers, right? Yeah, yeah, the five claws. They, you know, the Chinese dragon has five claws, and in country like you see in Korea, they have four claws because they're a vessel state. You know, and according to Koreans, if they put five claws on the dragon coins, China will come and take over. It's probably pretty bad luck. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> well, only the emperor can have five claws. Like, for example, if you see the prince and duke in China with their dragon robes, they only have four claws. Only the emperor have five claws. So if you see an emperor's robe with five claws, then that was worn by the emperor. 
And there's other there's other like sort of symbols that, uh, on that design that are significant. You know, there's that mystical orb. Right, right. The, the you know that that the pearl. Right. You know, basically the dragon and the pearl is basically you know that with you know approval by the heavens. So that's very very critical. You know that that it's like kind of a the dragon always has a, a pearl with 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 the dragon. And, and so, why in some of those coins is it, is it bilingual? It's like written in English, but then it's also well. Well, you have to realize, you know, you know, machine struck coins were first, you know, struck in Germany, fourteen, I think, eighty four or eighty six, and you know, they have four or five, four hundred years of history. So a lot of the the dragon coins actually were designed by Westerners, you know, and the machines were produced by, you know, Germany, England, U.S. So that's why it has a big influence, and that's trade, you know, Chinese and English. And, and these 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 circulated for quite a long time. Uh, yes, they, they you know for the first Chinese struck coin was 1889, and then you know they struck out you know the imperial coins went up to you know 1911, but they actually circulated for far later than that because they're of good quality and the silver you know, is is uh, you know still pretty good standards. Well, when did the Chinese sort of stop the practice of counter stamping coins? Well, the chart mark coin, according to Colin Colbert in his chart mark book that he came out about a couple of years ago, you know, the chart mark became less, you know, uh, conductive in the 1920s because the bankers stopped taking chart mark coins. You know, and you know the the silver shops used to chop out all the coins to test the silver. But when the banks became a big business and some of them were run by the government, they stopped taking chart mark coins as payment. And that, that therefore they start doing ink chops instead of you know actually chops into the coin. So you see some Yuan Shikai dollars and other coins in the twenties they have ink chops from the merchants rather than actual chops into the coins, which damages the coin. Yeah, you know it's interesting. You know when I, when I was uh, coming up as a collector in the eighties, it seems like at that time like U.S. trade dollars or any other kind of coin that had chop marks on it were, were considered by collectors as being damaged. But That's it right. Se it seems like now that. The attitudes have shifted, where people have actually become very interested. Well, one, in one, of the, one of the major, you know, reason for that is, uh, you know, one of the biggest, most important writers, and he actually collects the, the shop trade dollars, is David Bowers. You know, he actually was a member of the, of the, the Chap Mark Club, and also he, he talked about those coins in his uh, in his, his trade, uh, trade dollar book, and also the registry sets by the grading services. Also, like for the 1875P, you know, Chap Mark graded, there's only a population of a few. And then and to build the number one registry set, you really need to have one of those. You know, we, I have one of those in the Rose Collection. I actually bought the Rose Collection, you know, in complete. You know, and the reality is, you know, the U.S. part became much more valuable because of this. You know, the, there was a Chuck Boss dollar in there, a City of Liberty dollar, and some of the key trade dollar dates. And back in the old days, they were actually were significantly less than the coin without chop mark. Now, since it's only population of few, it's actually very rare if it's chopped and worth much more. Yeah, you know something I don't know if I've seen, I don't know what I'm thinking about it. It's like I don't know if I've ever seen like a chop mark coin with like really PQ toning. Have you ever seen anything like that? Oh yes, yeah, the trade dollars exist, you know. So what we've been told is sometimes in China, you know, the trade dollars come in and they chop it once, they throw it back in the bag, and the the bags can send back to the US because uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of some of these coins did not really circulate, you know, and the trade dollars is the only coin that the US actually demonetize. You know, so I guess they had to get the coins back there before it got demonetized. And, and when it got it demonetized, it was a problem. You know, the silver value was about 30 some cents versus what is it? And then the trade dollars actually have more silver than the regular coinage. Right. You know, so that, that's a lot of history there. So what would a, what would a PQ tone chop mark coin sell for over its normal value? Like, like, for example, you know, back 20 years ago, a nice, you know, trade dollar with Tony and chop mark probably worth 50% over one without chop mark. But now with a nice Tony and chop mark, the coins probably worth 50% more in, in grades up to 63. You know, so you have the AU58, you know, nice tone coin with a chop mark. It's going to worth double, triple than a generic 58 that's kind of, you know, with, with no Tony and white. And, and what about what about? It would seem to me that uh, ink chop marks would be a little bit more fragile than actual stamp chop marks. So do those bring a premium too? Uh, yes, people now start collecting them in China, especially when they're complete. They have the name of the the, 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 the silver shop that, that chopped the coins, you know. And people do collect them now. If it's the most of those have really nice original toning, you know, on these coins. So what would be a handful of really good uh, English language references that you could recommend for collectors? Well, the, 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 the number one book that people still use is the 1954-1960 edition of the Com book. You know, that has still the most information. And then recently, you know, there's been some research done by, you know, Richard Wright, but it's actually just articles that of, of all his he published and was printed by Spink. And, you know, 
to be honest with you, you know, the, the book that I, I worked with, with Ron Groove, you know, several years ago, Top Chinese Coin, is a bilingual guy, and that has some history and some auction record. It's a good coffee table book. It's not as intense as the comic book, but uh, it has a lot of useful information, you know, for collectors because it's bilingual. Are you amazed at Con? I mean, because I, I've, I have the Con book, I also have the Jacobson Vermeule book. Are, are, you, are you amazed at Con, like, in, in such a short period of time in China, was able to amass that amount of knowledge? Uh, well, you know, also Tom was very lucky because the, the time he was there, there was, there was a lot of turmoil, and he was able to look at a lot of great collections and buy some of the great collections when he left, you know, the China in 1949. And reality is, I don't think anyone will ever have the chance he had. Because he bought coins from the Woodward collection in the 50s, from um, Xu Han Shiman in New York, and he actually built some of these greatest coins, you know, after he left China. You know, so, so I, don't think it's, I, I don't see anyone ever having the same opportunity he had. And most of the rare coins out there came from World War Khan. You know, if you look at the pedigrees of all these great rarities, like the Goodman sale, yeah. the, the, that's where the pedigrees are. Yeah, I mean, how much money do you think that collection, if his collection came to market today? Uh, today, probably hundred million, I would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's probably a good number. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it's amazing. Like I said, it, it, it's one thing to have like a roadmap and go put a collection together. I mean, you have to have resources and you have to yeah. have the opportunity. I mean, the one guy that bought a lot of his coins was Urban Goodman. So Urban probably had one third to half of his coins, and then Haru Chen bought some of the best coins that Urban Goodman had, and. You know, that guy also bought a lot of the coins from Eli Wallet, who bought some of the original Khan coins, and also some of the heat and archive. You know, you know, I would say, you know, Haru Chen's coins, if there was not, some of those coins been sold, but he hasn't broken up his collection, his collection would be worth $100 million. So, uh, you know, in, Amer uh, in the United States, you know, Louis Eliasberg's famous for attempting and completing the complete, you know, date and mint set of U.S. coins. Mm -hmm. Does anybody come even remotely close to China? Uh, the only guy is, uh, is Khan and no one else in China. You know, because one thing about Chinese collectors, some of them only collected crowns. There's very few collectors collected crowns and, and, and copper coins and minor coins. Like, for example, the guy that came closest to collecting all these coins was uh, Tracy Woodward. He collected, right, he had the best copper collection, and he had most of the rare silver coins, too. And also, he collected cash coins, too. A lot of collectors in China collected the only cash coin. They didn't collect any modern struck coin because they thought that was a worse than phenomenon. So, you know, some of the greatest collectors only collected Chinese cash coins, which uh, century war of monetary history. And, and Chinese cash coins, I mean, you got to kind of consider the fact that a lot of those were like, you know, looted. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, like the Boxer Rebellion, a lot of the great collection were looted and taken back to the countries. And, you know, and the, you know, the cash coin, you know, also the more recent phenomenon is all the digs in China with all the building, they have discovered incredible great rarities, you know, through some of these excavations. You know, because they're building all these new, you know, really high, you know, office towers and all these things, and they're finding incredible coins right now. Yeah, and, and I think also, you know, you have to consider, like, if you're a Western collector is used to, like, a certain type of preservation, that uh, the idea of mint state and cash coins, I mean, you really got to kind of alter well, your... Well, to be honest with you, that has a recent phenomenon in the last five years. Like, the quality becomes very important. You know, some coins that are, like, medium to, to rare in gem quality are putting huge money now. Yeah. You know, because people are now are taking consideration of the quality now. You know, before, it was always rarity. So you have a coin that might be even damaged, but they're putting a huge amount of money because that's the only one. No, now the combination is now it's rarity and quality. And you also, you know, you have to contend with the fact that the, the, the metal that's used to strike it, you know, that's does right. deteriorate. And, you you know, know. Also, you know, the Western, you know, strike coins only came upon the late 1800s. So before that, most of the big collectors collected Chinese ancient coins who have been around for thousands and thousands of history, history. And also the calligraphy on some of these coins are wonderful, you know. So there's a lot more varieties, you know. Also, also they represent part of Chinese history. Right. You know, so, so I, I think, you know, with the recent... You know, machine strike coins have become more valuable, but in terms of history, it's still a very short period of time. So do you think it's possible to, to complete a set of all, I mean, is it, would it be possible to complete a set of all Chinese known coins? Now, it's very difficult because some, some coins are only one or two known and they're in museums. So, so I, I think, you know, there might be other examples out there, but uh, it's very hard. It's not just money, but it's also, you know, the difficulty of getting a hold of coins that you don't know where they are now. Like there, there's a tail from, from the Korean that's been missing since the 1960s, and that's, that was the only known example. It might have been melted or destroyed. Is there images of it? Or? Yeah, there is, because the coin was in a famous collection from 1930s and 1960s. 
Right. You know, well known. You know, it's been they've been rubbing in photos, but the coin's been missing since the Cultural Revolution. What do you think it'd bring if it actually survived? Probably three million dollars or more. Yeah. So what's the record-setting price for a Chinese coin? At auction, you know, it's, it's for a modern coin that we purchased in Japan about four or five years ago, 1.6 million. But in private transactions, there's rumors that coins are traded for over 2 million. But in public, that you know, all the million-dollar transactions actually been handled by my company. You know, we have done private transactions, you know, for over that too. But, you know, we, we consider public transactions to be more legitimate. Right. You know, because that's really, you really have a way to track it. You know, but there's there's rumors out there that some coins were sold for three million dollars privately, but we're not sure if that was really true or not. So, uh, last question. This might be a, a sensitive one. Um, you think about like some of the great uh, collectors that you know we've talked about, like Khan, Jacobs, Mule, uh, Woolward, the Western collectors have pro taken this this culturally important material out of the country. Mm -hmm. How much of the great rarities have been repatriated? I would say, you know, 30 to 50 percent, you know, I mean, it's been a gradual, you know, since the first Hong Kong auction, I, I think, you know, the money company has, has really contributed to this. And, you know, when they started the auctions in Asia, they to bring the interest back into Asia, like most of the buyer back in those days were from Taiwan, you know, and they, you know, two or three collects of Taiwan built the greatest collection of struck Chinese during that period. But now more and more mainlanders are buying, buying coins. But still, the best collection of uh, modern vintage coins is still in Taiwan between two or three collectors there. And they're fairly, fairly young, they're all under 50. So do you think once these, these rarities get, get purchased and by collections in the mainland, they'll ever be able to leave? No. No. No, I don't think so. But, but the, 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 the current situation is there's no real mainland collector that has the quality and quantity of the collectors in Taiwan, which are more of a collector base, the mainland collector more of the investment oriented. So it's, you know, one of the leading collectors in the last 10 years that has to start selling off his collection after only five years. Do you think the interest in the collecting these uh, classic rarities in Taiwan is due to the history of like how- Absolutely, yeah. I think, you know, there's more, like for example, at the Palace Museum in Taiwan, you have more Chinese antiquities than China. And also you have also, you know, the heritage of some of the Chinese culture, like for example, you know, they, they use still complex script, they still practice the Chinese pensmanship. You know, also, there's also a more longer record of the collecting interests, you know, because some of the biggest collectors in Taiwan in the 70s to 90s built the greatest collection. They're kind of following their footsteps. And these guys are much younger. These guys started collecting in the, maybe in, in the 90s. And they're both, you know, two of the biggest collectors now are all under 50 years old. When's your next sale and, and you got anything really cool uh, The next it? sale is August 20th in Hong Kong and we have a part two of this Childish Tenant collection which is a wonderful collection of coins of this uh, French person that worked in the Chinese uh, custom you know, service for over 30 years and he took the coins back to France in the 1930s and then sitting in France for about 70 years until we had the first sale last year in November and, you know, and it had great results. You know, wonderful quality, the coins that we've never seen this quality before. They were selling in these, uh, these sacks in France for 70 years. Wow. You know, and the, in a collection like this, in Kubernetes are much harder now. Because when the market went up about five, six years ago, a lot of coins came out, you know. The Jigwe collection was sold, you know, Richard Wright collection. A lot of collection was sold because of this, the price increases. So it's not much harder, like almost like the U.S. market, you know, fresh material, but a lot of attention, a lot of time auction, just some retreads, you know, auction have been sold three to five times in the last five years. That's a lot of transactions. So how can somebody get a copy of your catalog and bid on this sale? Well, you could come uh, register on the Life Auctioneer, which is we feel strongly is as the independent bidding platform, and like the, some other platform with the company that controls the, the, the platform, which I'm not sure how, how, how secure that is, you know? And what, what Life Auctioneer is truly independent. I mean, we don't know what you bid, and you know, we don't know when you bid. And also you could come to our website, you know, the you know, WW Champion, uh, I think it's a CH, uh, let me see, uh, cghka.com, or you could try to, uh, you know, contact us, you know, to, you know, some of you know, social media, you know, or contact Coin Week, you know, and we, we should have stories on there and about some of the highlight coins, you know, very, very, the catalog should be out around middle of July for this August 20 auction, and some of the highlight coins will be at the Denver ANA for people to take a look. All right, Michael, good luck with that, and thanks for uh, sharing this information. I learned so much talking to you about it. And thank you. You know, we always, you know, are trying to help promote, you know, you know, exchange information. And I think anytime you have, uh, you know, some more 
interesting questions. We're very happy to answer them. All right, great. Thanks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and we'll bring you down with all subjects and episodes.